my earliest template of how a man should be came from looking at my father. He was and still is someone I respect very much. As a child, he was the Omega to my mother's Alpha. I tried my best to be a good son. I was never stepping too far out of line. His military training extended into the household and the methods he chose to raise me and my sisters were very valuable. But I knew no matter how hard I tried, I could never be my father. His childhood heroes were Jim Brown, Malcolm X, and John Wayne. These men personified power, intellect, and what it means to be an American man. Although I did not care for John Wayne at any level, I understood his appeal. What you see is what you get from him. To understand the power and brute strength of Jim Brown, he was a monster on the field, and I admired his pursuits in film and television. He was a true pioneer in every sense of the word. However, when I looked at Malcolm X, he was different. Far more than all the other heroes. He seemed refined and intelligent. He spoke with an eloquence and purpose for not only the betterment of the black race, but also spoke repeatedly about the need for black people as a race to break free of the slavery of the mind. These were powerful models for my father, including his own father who was a military man. The closest I've ever been to joining the military was joining JROTC in high school. My heroes growing up were never as militant or manly as my father's. For most of the 80s, my heroes were Ralph Macchio, Bruce Lee, Michael Jackson, Prince, Matthew Broderick, Tom Cruise, and Michael J. Fox. My heroes were mostly white, and it was all I knew and was exposed to back in the 80s. However, in the 90s, there was one hero who embodied the brute strength and swagger of Jim Brown and who had the intellect and fire of a revolutionary like Malcolm X and the tell it like it is, no holds back quality of John Wayne. His name was Tupac Amaru Shakur, and he was my idol. My hero in the 90s. I loved everything about him. He could somehow appear thuggish, rebellious, and militant one moment, and the next, he was quoting scripture and crafting beautiful socially conscious poems and taking on activist causes like br police brutality and homelessness. He seemed to me at times a man wrestling with the various destinies and states of being. He was inspirational and very cool which mattered tremendously to a young adolescent like myself. Tupac was complex and charismatic. Tupac was wild and restrained all at once. I was a fan of the man. However, when I stumbled upon his film roles and found a new appreciation of the man, the myth, the legend, I was overjoyed. In this video, I want to discuss my three favorite scenes from two of my favorite films featuring Tupac Shakur. I will, of course, share what I like particularly about these scenes. So let's get to it. The first clip is taken from the 1993 romance drama, Poetic Justice, directed by the late great film director, John Singleton. The film takes place shortly after the infamous LA riots. We follow Justice, a woman who has lost her boyfriend to senseless gang violence, and she's in mourning. She's an incredibly talented woman who writes poetry and is a beautician at a local salon. The salon is tasked with attending an upcoming fashion show, and they need Justice and her peers to do the hair for the models in the show. Aisha, Justice's best friend and played by the remarkable Regina King, has an idea. She wants to play matchmaker to Justice. And her boyfriend, Chicago, has a friend named Lucky, who has to make a large mail delivery from L.A. to Oakland during the same time as the fashion show. Aisha believes that if Justice and her attend this mail delivery run with Chicago and Lucky, that at least Justice has a chance to rekindle love again. And at the very least, she can save money on gas attending and getting to the show. 
This clip has a lot of F-bombs, but I want you to pay attention to Tupac's performance. Janet does a great job of matching and complementing Tupac's energy in this scene. And Regina King is always outstanding, no matter what. What I love about this scene is that Lucky is, for a lack of a better word, corny. In the beginning, he is trying to spark a conversation with Justice. And he is failing spectacularly. He senses that, for me, to get a reaction out of Justice, a response out of this beautiful woman, I have to launch a toxic Hail Mary. I like how Tupac's facial expression changes from corny, cheeseball, and solemn and desperate <laughs> to ruthless and coldness as he smokes a cigarette. Even his voice changes in tempo and timber. It's giving off a, I don't give a fuck vibe. And I don't care that that's what I said, what I said vibe. I'm not condoning his behavior. I just like the dynamism of his portrayal. I like how Janet does not back down and lets him have it. 
When I first saw the scene, I thought to myself, I would never say those things to Janet the Goddess Jackson. But a part of me understood why Lucky used the tactic that he did. Aisha uses the word tripping to console justice, and she's right. Tripping back in the day meant having irrational or crazy thoughts. It also means getting crazy high, but there are multiple meanings. These crazy thoughts are tied to his affection for her. So in a way, if you look at it in two different ways, ways tripping is, is an apt word. He is high off of his affection for justice, and it's making him think crazy. It's making him do crazy things. He's in love. Love is a drug, you know, so to speak. So my favorite parts of the entire scene are not when the, they, when the pair spew F-bombs at each other, but when Aisha tells Lucky to go back and get justice and the crew is driving alongside while Justice is walking. When Justice stumbles, Aisha and Chicago, played by the great Joe Torrey, laugh. But I noticed that Lucky did not laugh. He didn't even smirk. He just turned his head. Is this out of respect for her? Is he still mad and the act did not register with him? I don't know, but I thought that was incredibly thoughtful. I thought that what he did mattered. And what he didn't do mattered. I think it's because he cares for her. And like I say, what is not said between two people is just as important as what is said. The last reason I love this scene is Tupac had great comedic timing and delivery. He knew what was funny and he could communicate that excellently. When Justice gets back on board the mail truck with the crew and she looks at Lucky and, ador and adorably says, they still going to fuck you up. Lucky watches as she climbs aboard and as he blurts out a twist on the classic Gone with the Wind line from Rhett Butler. And when he says, frankly, my dear, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> um, it's a nice period to place on a wonderful scene, expletives and all. In my video discussing chemistry, I discuss how important it is for a film to have actors who demonstrate great chemistry. Tupac, Janet, Regina, and Joe all work together to make this scene great. But Tupac is the one to make it memorable. And he is the one to have the last word and the last laugh. This next scene takes place on the East Coast and a year before the film Poetic Justice. In the film, Juice, directed by acclaimed cinematographer and filmmaker Ernest Dickerson. Juice depicts the tale of four young black men trying to make it in the projects of New York back in the early 90s. The teens are a member of a gang called The Wrecking Crew. Their motto is, no one man is above the crew. Meaning, the crew is everything. We rise together or we fall together. The members of the record crew are as follows. Q, played by the legendary Omar Epps, is the protagonist of this tale. He is a DJ who loves music and dreams of getting a record deal. He often sells his mixtapes to his friends at school. Throughout the story, he gets a once in a lifetime chance to make his dreams come true by entering a city-wide DJ battle competition. The prize is a deal with a record company. There's one small problem. The Wrecking Crew has a robbery planned during the same night as this competition. Raheem, played by Khalil Kane, is the leader of the Wrecking Crew, who always wears the latest fashion, and he always knows what to do in any given situation. He has the respect for juice, and loyalty of everyone in the crew. Raheem also has a child that he has not been taken care of. His ex-girlfriend is always asking him for him to pay his share for their son's well-being, and he does not have the funds. Raheem needs to make some fast money so that he can not only finance his false lifestyle, but also provide for his child. An opportunity presents itself in a robbery of a local grocery store. Steele played by the underrated talent Jermaine Hopkins, is a person who is the jokester of the group. He wants everyone to have a good time. He loves cooking and rock walking around with a stereo. He loves video games and challenges everyone in the local pool hall to a game of Street Fighter. Playing for quarters. Ah, brings back so many memories. Um, anyway, Steele is someone who likes to go along to get along. He's in his very nature, a people pleaser. And on one particular afternoon of playing hooky from school, plays a pivotal role in the outcome and lives of every member of his crew. Last but not least, Bishop, 
played by Tupac Shakur. Bishop is the rowdy member of the crew. He's willing to get into any scrap with anyone who disrespects the crew. He also has a big mouth and has been telling everyone he can beat the shit of the leader of the rival Puerto Rican gang. Bishop has a father who displays forms of some type of catatonia or PTSD in the early scenes of the film. It is hinted he was assaulted in prison. Bishop admires men who go for theirs and imbibe the death before dishonor creed. He feels he and his crew are pathetic, a joke in the hood. Bishop needs money, but more than that, he needs the world to know that he has the juice to get things done. He gradually be becomes the main villain of the story. So that is a very brief rundown of the characters and motivations in the story. The scene I want to show are actually two scenes from the same movie. One is before the actual robbery event, and the other is the aftermath. For this scene, I want you to pay attention to Tupac's performance, the energy, the passion delivery of his words. This is the scene that sets the stage for Bishop becoming the villain and Q becoming the hero. What I love about this scene is that how Tupac can embody both quiet and calm moments with passion filled rage in the blink of an eye. The power dynamic in this scene is outstanding. Bishop is calm, almost heartfelt when his outburst is dismissed by Raheem. He says, That's because you know I'm right. In your heart, you know I'm right. Yo, While Q and Steel get the full brunt of his rage. Feel like I'm on a goddamn track team. I'm serious. I'm right. Yo, big man. If you want respect, you got to earn it. You damn right. You got to be ready to go down, stand up, and die for that shit like Blizzard did. If you want. Bishop is somehow someone who is ruled by fear. Fear of being nothing. Fear of being locked up. Fear of being like his father, which is a real feel fear for anyone. Bishop is the driving force influencing Raheem. I feel that a robbery is an answer to all of Wrecking Crew's problems. Every time I hear Tupac start his dialogue with Q, I get the chills, especially when he says his last line. I'm not trying to tell you you ain't shit. I will tell your mama you ain't shit. Like mama is. God to children, to, to men, you know, you don't mess with a man's mama. Um, and I know some people may not, may not have really great moms, but saying that line in the hood to another person, like that's just license to get fucked up, but I'm going to continue his delivery, his mannerisms, the way you can see him say his line so ferociously 
that visible spit is seen leaving his mouth. The scene is very raw in every sense of the word, and it's mostly done with only dialogue. No special effects, no sweeping score, just actors acting beautifully. The last scene I would like to show again shows Tupac's brilliance in giving even quieter scenes the same level of intensity and fury. This scene is after the robbery and after the cops question the surviving members of the wrecking crew. Omar Epps is outstanding in this movie, but my eyes are always locked in and drawn to Tupac. Let's get to the scene. seen a couple days what's been happening man get off that shit it's over it ain't nothing nobody can do about it man what do you want from me man nothing just came to see if you was all right see how you been doing well i ain't, I ain't talked to nobody all right i know what <laughs> cool. always will be just came to see what's up. Let me tell you something, B. I'm only playing your fucking game because ain't shit else to do. But don't you ever pull a gun on me again in your life. Well, I hope I won't have to. Yeah, we all go down if you do, because we all crew. Just try me if you think I'm bullshit. <laughs> Look at this. The brother finally decides to stand up like a man and throw down. Too bad Raheem had to die first, huh? It's over. Everything starts from now. We all go down unless we stay together. Ain't no one man above the crew. You know that shit. You're crazy, man. You know what? When you said that last time, I was kind of tripping, right? But now, you right. I am crazy. But you know what else? I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck about you. I don't give a fuck about Steel. And I don't give a fuck about Raheem either. So yeah, this scene is shot so close and set up like a horror movie of how Bishop appears out of nowhere. Usually you see this type of shot or this scene when a slasher or a monster is chasing a woman, but here it's with two men. So I like that, that dynamic. It's almost like stalker quality to it. What I love about this scene is that he was not backing down, but he is also not pressuring Bishop too much because as he has stated before, the guy is crazy. I like the range of emotion Bishop displays. He realizes he is insane, but he loves to see the fear in people's eyes. It's an addiction tormenting people and having them dance to his tune. Q has always been the smartest, strongest, bravest one of the wreck crew. And Bishop knows this. Bishop realizes I need to be very careful with this guy. So I will ski scare him and tease him a little bit just to test him out. However, it's when Q says, you are crazy that Bishop embraces the label. That's when Bishop says, I don't give a fuck about myself. I ain't shit. That is a whole other level of sorrow that I begin to feel. And it's at this point that Bishop has fully embraced who he is. He's become fully that villain. He's willing to do anything possible to get what he wants. Um, as long as he doesn't have to go to jail, 
as long as he doesn't have to pay the price, as long as he can make it known that he is the top dog in the Wrecking Crew. He's the only one in the Wrecking Crew. In fact, he'll probably make his own crew if he had to, but it's at this point, there's, there's no going back in the same movie. And in this movie, he showed so many different dynamics of his acting ability from comedic to, you know, horrific to menacing to loving and caring to sweet and sensitive. Like it, all of this was all embodied within him. And it's a real loss that Tupac is gone because I can't imagine the type of actor, the type of man he would be if he was still alive today. Um, he would probably be, I think in his fifties, if he was still alive today. And just think of like, he would be in some of these really awesome movies that we have out right now. Some of these Academy award winning movies. I pre I'm pretty sure he would have won an award eventually, but he was on that trajectory. So yeah. Um, final thoughts. I, I wanted to make this video because I remember how Tupac made me feel back in the day and still does even to this day. Um, he gave me hope. He told me to keep my head up, that things are going to get better, that I not only have to be brave and compassionate with myself, I have to be brave and compassionate with others. Tupac never wanted to be put in a box and always strive to break barriers. Throughout his brief career and in these roles, I can see so many dimensions of Tupac. I can see his fire, his passion, his depression his longing, his sorrow, his sensitivity, his tenderness, his joy, and wanting to be anything more than what society wants him to be. I am a man, a man who makes mistakes. I'm not perfect. I'm just trying to be. But every day I'm fighting with myself to be who the world wants me to be and to just be myself. This video is in honor of Tupac and anyone who never had the opportunity to just be. Um, I'm going to end the video here, but I wanted to end it with the words from Tupac himself. He could always put things from his heart better than I ever could. So I'll go ahead and play a little bit, but what he says here is what I'm trying to communicate to everyone out there to you. So I hope you take something valuable from his words. That's all I got to say. Enjoy. You know, every time I speak, I want the truth to come out. You know what I'm saying? Every time I speak, I want to shiver. You know, I don't want them to be like, they know what I'm going to say because it's polite. They know what I'm going to say. And even if I get in trouble, you know what I'm saying? That ain't that what we're supposed to do. It's, I'm not saying I'm going to rule the world or I'm going to change the world. But I guarantee that I will spark the, the, the brain that will change the world. And that's our job, is to spark somebody else watching us. We, we might not be the ones, but let's not be selfish. And because we're not going to change the world, let's not talk about how we should change it.